So there's the first one, the first uh, uh, record under War's name alone. Yeah, um, okay. What can you guys tell me about that when you broke out on your own? Uh, how did you feel about this record, both commercially and um, artistically? Listen, this, this was the big push for War to come out on its own. War. We, we were coming out with Sano Sun, uh, whatever, whatever we put on that record right there. It didn't make a think we might sell 50,000 copies. And it was like the big letdown for War coming out because we were supposed to come out on this first album and just like take it right to the moon. And we did. Our first album kind of like fizzled. So we had got to me, Sano Sun was a good song, but it was a mediocre song as far as like for people to like, uh, uh, we want to get wars coming out of Eric Burton with the song Fibica. We did a, a, a song from the creators. It was a lonely feeling. Yeah. That was a song we had in the creators. We, we weren't prepared musically to come out and do our own album at the time. We were like panically putting things together. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what? I think actually you were prepared. You were, they were you were being allowed to take the things that you were already, whether, whether they were good material or not, that you were kind yeah. of seasoning you've done. You start from something like that, and then it evolves to to something that was more uh, organic, what we, we created together. But like a tune like a "Son of Sun," yeah. that was the and that and Vibeke was the first one of the first things that I was so proud of that I could say more than anything with Eric Burton that I this is what I want to do is why we're talking about harmonica and saxophone. Being like the uh, horn section or melodies. It was, it was a great song. What, yeah, but not just Vibica, but also the horn lines and the Son of Sun. Oh, yeah. You know, in case that funky guitar yeah. line you did. Ba -da -da -da, ba -da -da -da, ba -da -da -ba 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 -da. I mean, that stuff was like, man, I was just like, yeah, I was we, so proud of it. Yeah, we liked it, but for what our expectations, we had this great album, you put it out there. This is your first child, you're looking, oh, you're so beautiful, this, that, the other. And people say, I, I don't like your baby. Your baby's ugly. Yeah, that's <laughs> what it was. It was, our, it was our, actually our transition from being a that's right. cover band behind Eric Burton uh -huh. to being our own self. That was just our transition. That's true. Okay. But, but then while we were with Eric, we were in England, and I wrote a song called Slipping Into Darkness, right? I took it to Eric. I said, Eric, you got this song for you called Slipping Into Darkness. Listen to it, man. Thumbs down. No, yeah, but you know that was that was funny. Now I've been working on a rhythm. <laughs> but the, and then I said I would make it fit in there. Collectively, <laughs> collectively when, when 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 we had the song, we did slipping in the darkness, and it was like the longest thirteen minutes you know song. Nobody's gonna play this song on the radio. It was thirteen minutes long. But it wanted to be our very first hit because it was different. We, but we we worked <laughs> we worked that song. We broke slipping in the darkness. Yeah. And it hit and Steve Topley worked on Slipping in the Girl. Darkness was a song to transition the war from being a backup band to being a band that could stand on its own. Yeah. From that point on, we were we, you know, we were ready for but it. But you know, yeah. you know, guys, it's it's everything we've done is more than just a song. Right. The song itself wouldn't 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 have enough legs. There was a chemistry in the way we play together that right. is half of is is half of the magic. Yes. Uh, that's why uh Again and again and again, like they used to tune Lowrider, which is like tequila. It's like it's a standard today. Everybody's using in different scenarios. It would be a lot cheaper if everybody just got the sync rights from the publishing company, but for them to also want to include the masters license to the master to use it um, is a proof of that because most tunes you can emulate and make it feel like the same thing by re recording it. Right. And you would save a lot, a lot of money. Okay. But, but the uniqueness <laughs> and the, not just the person's voice, but the instrumentation, everything, whether it's harmonica, sax, his guitar playing, the drums, the bass. We, there's a chemistry in the sound, the way we play together, that, that if anybody else tries to play the chords, yeah. the vocals and all that, it would sound so, it'd be very like polished. <laughs> the college, it, it wouldn't have the, the dirt and the stuff that we, and that's, so that's part of the composition is the arrangement. Well, well, yeah, I think the chemistry is, is, is key, like you yeah, said, also, also like words like, recorded and the, the, the um, you know, the variables of the whole recording situation. But <clears throat> Lee, you, know, you were talking about the chemistry, and I want to jump in before we move on and just ask if you could kind of 
summarize what each original member brought to that mix that was unique, you know, and also not was unique about their 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 playing or their style, yeah. uh, maybe also their personality. Well, I mean, personalities, yeah, but the but the top style, like I mentioned as an example, always about Howard. If you look at a guitar book and you want to look up what's the C C chord in guitar, well, we all know a C chord is the C E and G. If you want to play a G chord, we know it's G B D. And, you, and everybody else show exactly where you put your fingers to play any of these notes to make that chord or that chord. The distance away, any guitar players and look at a guy on stage and they can and say, oh, he's playing an A minor seven. So he's playing, okay? When, you, when Howard plays an A minor seven or C chord, using the same combination of notes to play that chord, which is why it's an A minor seven, A, C, E, G, or whatever you do. But the way he'll figure and all that, is still using different other strings to get those combination yeah, of notes. And and, yeah, and those things itself is already going to have a different texture than the cookie cut C chord and most people playing the guitar. Point mm -hmm. one. Point two, you got a guy like Hale Brown who cannot play the same thing twice, you know, if he's thinking. He can play it in the moment. Okay? Hale Brown will play inside the music where a lot of drummers will have a pattern they figured out and uh, play that, but they're not inside the music. It's like a rudiment rather than in the moment. You know, you got a guy like Charles Miller on his saxophone who was a brilliant saxophone player. He was so good that he had no ego issue to stoop down on the level that I was on to be able to take what I was good at and melody lines and hook lines with my limitations, but what I was able to do and join in on that. And enforce that rather than trying me to play, da, 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 you know, all these horn things, the cliche stuff that a lot of horn players would would uh, would try to uh, lean on. So there was, you know, Papa D. Allen, like Hale Brandon mentions to other percuss players when they join us. Man, mm -hmm. Papa D. Allen had one skin in well, They overplay. They overplay. You don't need to, but but again, it doesn't matter if they got 10 percussion or one. Play. It's, it's, it, I don't, I don't want to measure that. The point is that. He played with, with such um, finesse and all that. Chase. He was the one that pointed out to me a brilliant comment he made, and I interpreted it my way. I don't know if it was verbatim, but, I, but percussion to me is the punctuation marks. Right. It's like when, you, when I write out words, it's a sentence. If I don't know where to put the comma, if I, there's no comma or anything, it's the just a lot of words, mark. you wouldn't know where the thought started or where the thought ends. In any phrasing or in any sentences, there wouldn't be any of that. Just a lot of words. So, so drumming and percussion and all those things to to emphasize the pockets and the phrasing that uh, that I would be playing or the sax or guitar. I mean, there's all these things that that in affects each other and how we do it without it being like rehearsed and it's like painting by numbers. But it's like every moment we play, it's going to be different. We play tunes through the years. And they have evolved. And I, 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 I honestly know that it's just so different than it was way back. I listened to a cassette I recorded every night, you know, back in the days. And if I was the A and B, it's like, it's like there's so many places it's evolved. And when we go back and play, we're going to, even when we have played months to get alive, we'll go back and as if we, as if we never stopped. But we'll start from something, not consciously, not consciously, from playing the tune the way we last time played it. I mean, it's, it's just, there's just something in the chemistry that's so natural rather than it being from the brain. You know? Yeah, but then like BB, because Howard and BB and Jack Nelson ourselves, we come from a certain rhythm section. And with that rhythm section, whoa, <laughs> you want to start to funk. <laughs> oh, BB's amazing. Yeah, because see, BB, he, would, he had a certain way of playing against my bass drum and, it, and it matching between myself and Howard. Because he was sort of like a glue on the rhythm side. Because, like, uh, he started playing when he played that bass, those overtones and stuff in his tone notes, he would pick. Yeah. And then he knew and let those strings rattle. Yeah, the BB B B B was probably one of the finest bass players, uh, of contemporary bass players around today, if he was, you know. But he was one of the finest bass players, and he came from the band War, and he added all those super bass Amazing. lines to, to the songs we did. And, and Lonnie Jordan, being uh, the key out of Compton, uh, he was out of Compton, he was with us, and and he was 
a good keyboard player. I'll give him that right there. He's a good keyboard player. Vocalist, he could sing, but the best vocalist by far in the whole well, band was B.B. Davidson. But he never really, I don't think he ever took it to the no, place that he could. But if you listen, you listen to the way he sang World is a Ghetto, you can hear his, his potential, the crooniness in, in his voice. Uh, so he, he was, was a crooner. A great, great, great vocalist. At the same crooner. time playing the bass, yeah. amazing. <laughs> I, I could never do that. But. No, I couldn't And speaking about Lonnie, you know, uh, Papa D. Allen used to always say to me, Lonnie Jordan is like a miming bird. I mean, he, he would mimic stuff. He was very good at mimicking stuff, but I would say that the one that was the least unique in the band would be Lonnie Jordan. Well, I don't Ooh. know about that. I he, think so. Well, Lonnie, that's he would play like he plays. That's why we got right stuff. left. That's why we got right left. He plays other cliches. Yeah, he played cliches, okay. but that's he not knew, unique. I know, but he <laughs> he knew how to take with the rhythm section because we grew up playing together. He knew kind of how to, the tasty chords were to place them. We're not to have to overplay. I mean, he got to a point where he did start overplaying, but he had. But it was a perfect time. Yep. It's sort of like the that uh, stone soup. <laughs> that old, you know, probably you don't want to talk about the stone soup. Yeah, yeah, I've read it to my son. Yeah, yeah, it was sort yeah. of like that. We all came in. We're going to make this beautiful soup or gumbo, and he'd come there and how you know, he would throw a little mix in there, some of that Danish stuff in there, because see, that's what was unique about Lee, because we came there. We was a bunch of homeboys straight out of Compton, Long Beach, San Pedro, L.A., whatever. We playing all this funk, and all of a sudden, we've got this beautiful you know, harmonica taking these European lines over the top and then bringing Charles Miller together against that funk and that Latin made it unique. Yeah, but, but one thing with all the uniqueness going on, I got to sit back and pat myself on the back. Because they ain't see. They had to come up with God, I feel so good. Oh, how does that feel? <laughs> oh, hey, can we yeah. have a moment? <laughs> like, 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 you have to have these incredible stories that they can latch on to and put all these beautiful rhythms behind and the rhythms behind. And I would come up and say, okay, I was the lead writer as far as like, giving them the storylines. Here's, right. here's the direction that we should go in, in the studio. Cisco Kid was a friend of mine. Da, 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 da. Do, 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 do. All those things right there. So I would come up with the, just the just direction, and everybody would fill in the whole things with the branches and everything, and we take that and fly with it. Yeah, because like Papa D, when Quirrell is again. Yeah. We started, because we was all out in Pomona, California, this guy from Compton, San Pedro, whatever, and Long Beach. We'd go over there, and we first started hanging out, like, you know, going over to, you know, what is Malibu, Bel Air. And we started, remember, forget that time. We got over there in uh, Malibu, and we started realizing their toilets back up too. Yeah, wait, look, they have, the cars have flats. Wait, 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 <laughs> wait, wait. Papa D did the same. Walking down the streets, no, yeah, you know, we went to get the studio. And it's great song, great song, great lyrics, great lyrics. But when he says, "Don't you know that is true?" That I said, "Damn, Papa D," I said, "That ain't no good, man. Don't do that part. <laughs> messing up the whole song by putting that. The world is a ghetto." Oh, that was no. Papa D. Yeah, <laughs> so I, said, I said, "Don't you put that part in." He said, "No, Scott, you know." But anyway, that was the, that was the hook line for the world's get a great song, lyrics all the uh -huh. way through. Papa D wrote that. He put that hook. But that hook line, "Don't you know?" came like from a big jazz thing. "Don't you know that is true that for me and for you, the world is a ghetto." I said, "Don't use that line, D. That was a killer." <laughs> what I know. Yeah, but see, the thing about us <laughs> too. Then, then let's say you know where we were able to like Lee touched on it. We're known as a jam band. We get in there, we have a few shots or whatever, tequila, whatever. One is not enough, two is too many. But then all of a sudden, I hear people going, boom, 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 boom. Play that funky BB. You know, listen to my heartbeat is beating my funky. Bring in the bass and, and that was a total jam. That's so we, we would get the inspiration. We'd feed off each other. Well, let's let's keep rolling here. Let's get to the first album that really started what was the golden period for War. Um, I you agree that the first was album was more of a transitional record. This yeah. record, though, came out in '71, that same year. And besides the title song "All Day Music," which was a hit, it also had "Get Down" and the funk classic that um, Howard was just talking about, "Slipping in the Darkness." So, what stands out about these sessions? And um, 
How did it feel to attain that level of success on your own back then? Let, let, let me tell you one, one of the songs that on that album right there that I thought should have been hit. See, like I, I can always come to this Slipping in the Dark was is on there, which is ass kicking song. There was, a, there was an instrumental on it called Nappy Head. Mm -hmm. from Ghetto Man. I said, man, this has got to be the song that's going to get war back out there, mm -hmm. which is totally the wrong thing. They slipped in the dark. So, but, but Nappy Head was a great song. Uh, it should have been music, marketing the jazz and whatever. Yeah, all day music was. Well, that's cruising song. music. Yeah, it, it, just a killer song that got everybody into that. It was a summer song, came out the right time, pushed the thing. But then Slipped in the Dark, just everybody in the country was into that one. And with us, and Get Down, yep. we were right into that whole political thing about uh, the police and the justice, 11 one of us, they got to get down. If you run in the country and you ain't running that fucking, you know. Yeah, but that whole political thing under President Nixon, war was like this band that was like, hey, you guys are taking it too far. Yeah, but, but you know, that came from where we were still connected to where we came from. We were still connected, you know, to South Los Angeles, Compton, Long Beach. That photograph you got on the front of there, that was shot in Long Beach. I used to cruise by it all the time. Yeah, at that time. Right there on place. Hill Street, right there on Orange and 21st. Not so, you know, synagogues and stuff there in the it's a Jewish Saturday temple, right but it's still there. But see, that we were still connected. That we was, had we were, we were, that's our rehearsal. We come from rehearsal. Yeah. Time, and it's in weeks we, at that point, we hadn't moved into the big houses and stuff on top of the hill. We were still kind of living, hard. we were all still up on Adams. <laughs> you know, we hadn't moved. We were still really connected to our neighborhoods. And Bob Marley. We went on oh, that guy that was playing. And then we found out later that he was influenced from our stuff. For us. Before he had even, you know, crossed over and became Bob Marley to everybody here. And that line in Slip in the Darkness is the line that he got, which he came out with Stand Up for Your Right. But, um, but, um, yeah, because Bibi and I but, were walking. But, um, yeah, last time we were with, I was with Bob Marley, he was standing on my left, and Bibi was standing to Bob Marley's left. And we're in Atlanta going to do a radio program. He's doing me this. Brown, Brown, your band like my band. You guys speak band. You guys speak band. I do song for you. I do song for you. Get up, stand up. And that's where we were. And I said, wow. Okay, so he wrote that song for us. Oh, really? Yeah. That's right up and right, right up from there. Right. How did that success <laughs> change your lives? And was it my kind of song on the radio? I must have been really excited about it. Well, any time I heard something that we recorded, and then when it, when I would hear it, actually in a in a car on the radio, in a car, and and watching people on the walk and and you know you're driving and seeing people, and the sound of a compressed sound coming through the radio, it was like <laughs> it was magic. It was it was uh, much more than than knowing you got a record and listen to it at home or in any place, even in in the when they sell record players, yeah. they used our music uh, they, because of how it was mixed. Right. They used that to demonstrate the turntable. That was all cool. But there was something about when it came through the airwaves that was just like yeah. magic. Or well, somebody know. else was driving, I hear it coming out of their car. And then what, what, <laughs> what, what else is magic? When you went to, to your mailbox with a big old check. <laughs> Cha -ching. And you heard bounce. Mailbox money. You got a big royalty check. <laughs> Wait a minute. They keep you from here. They keep you from playing music. <laughs> oh. That was funny, man. Better than $400, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you would put more zeros behind it. <laughs> well, we, 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 we feel you know, pretty blessed as far as because when we jump into the business side of it, that's why we're all a team because. We have to look at the business side of it because there's things, yeah, there's ASCAP, there's BMI, and then there's sound exchange, there's few, reuse fees, few more union, you know, know there's about. so many things that are, that, are, that are coming out because of new technologies yeah. this, yeah. that aggregates and you, collect, you can collect royalties from. We haven't even touched on something but, but for anybody, if they ever hear and, and listen to this interview, there's something I've learned from years ago from Steve Gold. What's that? And that is that you only earn what you know how to claim. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And a big shout out. I got to say, I was always reading a lot of books, you know, the music, this business of music. So you want to get, you want to know the music business. So you want to be burned, you know, all these variations. And we always had it backwards for a long time. We was always going, getting attorneys. Yeah. And then one day, 
that came to it. I got to give a shout out to Fred Walensky. I found out I was reading a book one day, and we were doing it. Lee and I were together when we discovered this. We had to, you got to get, collect up all your contracts. It took a year to go back and do a timeline from when we first met June 6 and 7, all the way through 69, all the way through, and we had to collect all of our agreements. And we found that out. Then we had to find an accountant that was capable a of making account. a forensic accountant. Not just a plain one, we had to be a forensic and no music. And we were, uh, you know, we were led to a Fred Walensky. Big shout out, you know, he got to him and boy, he was able to go figure it out. And, you know, and look at it. Well, it's been a journey. Been a journey. Yeah, but you know, and, 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 and the legal world that unfortunately we had to deal a lot with is nothing to do with the business. The real, the, the real world of, in the music industry and called business mm -hmm. is a different animal <laughs> than the legal world. <laughs> than the legal world. <laughs> it's a totally different thing. And a lot of people, uh, I think, uh, are very confused between business and legality. Um, and just a quick point about that is if I make a deal, and I've learned all this from my house, <laughs> if I make a deal with somebody and I've spoken up for what I need in order for the deal to be, and they're agreeing, it's not good enough. Right. They sign. I got to make sure they understand what what, they, what they're agreeing to. Whatever. So there's no wrong expectations because I don't want the contract, legal contract, to be the burden of, of me claiming and, and I would win because they, we both agreed on something legally. I want to make sure that we agree and in business they agree too because if I'm going to take business down the road, there should be no wrong expectations. And if there's ever a time where we want to clarify something, it's because we want to continue doing business, not that we want to sue each other. Sue so, All right. Well, here's the uh, uh -oh. where picture was that you talked about That's earlier, and you can see the uh, Joe's, Joe's Burgers. Uh, right there there. That's Sunset Grill. We made a bad mistake. <laughs> Who's on the top of that top? Oh, yeah. Well, and there's that car with a flat tire. And you see the Rolls Royce? <laughs> There's the role. So this album um, really was when war peaked commercially. Um, the world is a ghetto. Sold several million copies following its 1972 release. And uh, besides the title track, it included Cisco Kid and Where Was You At, among other tracks. What can you share about um, these these sessions and the overall progression of, of the band at that time? I know, let me say this. One day I go to Howard's in Compton sitting on his amplifier. And I go up there and he said, Hell, I got a song. He bought a pool and he says, Cisco Kid was a friend of mine. Cisco Kid. And I said, Wow, I got a great idea in my head of rhythm. Because I've been listening to that. Uh, what's his name? I didn't have to thank you, but I thank you. I heard that ticky tacky, ticky tacky, ticky tacky. Yeah. And I said, well, the next time we go in the studio, I'm going to go that ticky tacky ticky. And Howard had that Cisco kid was a friend of mine. No, let me, let me, let me just say <laughs> So we had, we had World's Ghetto, which Papa D. Uh, penned the World's Ghetto, and he wrote that down. down and Long was, but we were playing in this club, and, 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 and Marina Del Rey's out there, we called Cisco's. And we were on stage playing the Cisco's, and just before we were going on stage, this guy came in, you know, off the street wino type you know and he wanted to hear a certain song and he came up to me and he asked me hey would you play like say you know, say my wild irish laws so the bouncer from cisco <laughs> came up and grabbed this little guy and tossed him out the room you know like a, a wet rag and i said hey cisco i said the cisco kid was a friend of mine from that point on so so oh, cisco kid so i went back to my childhood hero yeah, the Cisco kid who was on TV and came up with this whole story about Cisco kid. Throw that man out the dead gum club was a friend of mine. So yeah, a, then, and then the uh, horn lines that Lee and Charles Miller came up with. Yeah, but that's how we did things. So yeah, you know, I, I would come up with this, this whole storyline. They would come up with the parts and ranges to make which is a very very funky song. So the Cisco kid, as we marketed, took twenty minutes to go go. So. Yeah, because see, and when we, and when we, we were invited to play those TV shows, 
um, like talk shows. Like we were the first, one of the first bands, rock and roll band, whatever you want to call it. Like on the uh, Merv Griffin. Oh, 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 and oh, so, oh, like so we that. being a jam band, and we had Cisco Kid as a big hit. Now you got and um, two minutes, to make, and we 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 doing the um, for the cameras, not for our sake. They're doing the cameras to go through the tune so they can position it before they shoot it, right? <laughs> so we enter this jam, and we're like ten minutes into it, and we're barely getting started. <laughs> and like, and we all of a sudden you get this vibe like this guy's been standing for long. Stop! Stop! Oh, stop! Stop! <laughs> and then we we were actually pissed off. I mean, like you know how dare you? They it was cool. like sacred. I mean, we were just it felt so amazing. We just it the producers, down. your record is three minutes and fifty eight seconds. So we had to go back in the green room yep. and listen right. to Cisco Kid, and we got in fights <laughs> because we can never play the same way twice. And we had to play something fifth, three minutes and fifty eight seconds. Are you yeah. kidding me? Yeah. The intro is not even is even longer than that. But you know, then so after we, that, we were so sick well, of no, after, yeah, after yeah, that, so they learned that you have to you have to control. So they did lip singing, right. and the lip singing did not look good either. Fans. <laughs> so then they came up with the idea called TV mixes today. But right. the funny thing is, that method was years ago a product out of the United States called Music Minus One. <laughs> and Music Minus that. One was real to real tapes that jazz out anybody would get minus the sax solo and the vocal oh, and all that. Right. And that was exported to Japan. And in Japan, they loved it so much. It's a lot of alcohol and reverb. And everybody was, <gasps> and they called that karaoke. Yeah. And karaoke means. Empty choir. <laughs> oh, using minus one that. means empty choir. Then they export it back to the United States <laughs> and everybody's using karaoke. But meanwhile, just like the wheel is the man's greatest invention, and yet we slap all the stuff around around using wheels. They never thought about using music minus one when it came to TV shows, right? <laughs> it's just amazing how dumb this industry is. <laughs> but then we did go to that point of live music. We did start getting into the live music when you know, different uh, Don Kirshner's rock and various shows that we started doing. Yeah, you know, Soul that. Train. No, there was not. Yeah, that was live. Yeah. Yeah. But they would have to fade it out. Yeah, they would have to fade it out. Because commercialists, they can You know, and then the fans would be upset. Man, they just cut them off. You know, that's why <laughs> that part didn't work. All right. All right. The next the record, record, Deliver the, the World. world. Uh, and this Deliver one, the World. Uh, was still big hit, not as big as World Does It Get Up, but still substantial, certified platinum. Had Gypsy Man, Me and Baby Brother. Um, what was happening with the band around this time? And also, uh, what was your, I know you came out with a, a live record after this. So what was, you know, your live performance like back then? You know, what would a fan expect going to a war show around this time? Yeah, we got complacent, because what happens is you hit a peak. Yeah. You get there and then all of a sudden then you start thinking more how great you are than what your fans are. Yeah. And then you become complacent. I don't want to do this. Well, I'm not gonna we don't, you know, get together. One guy lives way over there, one lives way over there. You're not like a team, you're not right together breaking bread like we're doing now. Ferraris come in. We yeah. went to Caribou Ranch. No. We went to Caribou Ranch, well Gershon, whatever the guy who produced from Chicago, he owned this ranch up there. And we were going to go up there. When the problem was that they had snowmobiling, they had a, a chef that go made that we couldn't like the food because we just wanted regular meat and potatoes. <laughs> and he's trying to sell recipes to the wives. Um, we had everybody was snowmobiling, having a great time. There was hardly any recording, and the result of that was an album like like that, which yes. had some great moments and not so good moments. But, but and then the live album came out because they needed to be delivered another album. And we had recorded live stuff, and so Jerry Goldstein uh, pulls that out of the shelf and releases that, so he can live up to, you know, his deals and, and collecting the money. So let me tell you about this. This one That's song. That's my take. Here, here, here's this one song that I know came up. This uh, 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 delivered word album was "Me and Baby Brother," and we had we the "Me and Baby Brother" came off of. Uh, uh, the, the album we did with the uh, United Artists live album was me and baby brother. It came out of Boogie. We used to run together. Okay, that was me and baby brother. So I went to uh, uh, Sly Stone. He was up in the, in the far off production. I said, don't, don't, do don't, don't, don't. Like more Sly would like it. Right? I said, Sly, 
I said, I want you to record this song. It's a war song called Me and Baby Brother. So, do, 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 check. You know, more like what Sly would do. Sly said, uh, he wasn't having that, right? I said, okay. So we did Me and Baby Brother, the second the version. version yeah. The second version of Me and Baby Brother was the funk version. And that well, was still it. Yeah. It That's what we play it now. Yeah. But, but Sly, like I said, the first version was a real boogie version, which is okay. But the second version, me and baby brother, the punk version, that's when it took off that album up there. Right. But we were, we, we, we didn't do, we, like you were complacent, going to Caribou and all that yeah. stuff. Was... And, and, and Gypsy Man. I'll tell you, Gypsy Man was a song. It was our road song. We would be play yeah. Gypsy Man. Yeah. Uh, they called me a Gypsy Man. We, we, were talking about, we were talking about ourselves, ourselves, our life on the road. And we were on the road so much, we were going into like uh, Chicago. We got that wind. Yeah, we come out of Chicago. We was going into Des Moines, Iowa. And instead of going to Des Moines, Iowa, we bypassed Des Moines, Iowa, and went to Detroit. <laughs> and we got to Detroit and said, hey, "Listen, the gig you guys supposed to play was in Des Moines, Iowa, and it was too late for us to get there. We screwed that whole thing up. So that's how that Gypsy Man ain't got no home, staying on the road. Gypsy Man came about. That was our life on the road. I gotta find a friend." Nice young lady, you know, to make my home. That was Musicians are homeless, you know, homeless. girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. because see, that's what happened. When <laughs> we, we, were, we were road dogs, man. And we hit it so hard till we bypassed the city, thinking we had to go to Detroit instead of Des Moines, Iowa. Yeah, but see, that's how it was. And people didn't realize, in order back in those days, you had to travel, tour, hit these places, not only do any play, but you had to do interviews, you had to do this, you do that. And it was times we'd be out on, we'd be going away from home for months, months. and months be out on the road for nine months out of a year. Yeah. Well, let, me, let me ask you a couple of questions about the, the touring. Um, you, as a fan or a spectator, what, what could I expect the experience to be like being at a war show at that time? Um, and also that Gypsy Man story is, is a good one, but can you tell me one or two other Unforgettable stories from the road that come to mind. Yeah, I, I, I have. We all have. Yeah. Do you remember when we played Shea Stadium? Yeah. We played Shea Stadium, and we were the headliner. And I couldn't believe Ray Charles was not was on the on the bill. And mm -hmm. and Ray Charles is like God, my biggest in, you know biggest influence. And I'm watching him do his performance in the middle of the uh, field of Shea Stadium. And it's so, it's so removed from the people sitting in the stadium. And, it, and this little, little um, sound system he was using, <laughs> I mean, you could, you could tell he was frustrated and all that. It was, it was, it was embarrassing. And I was, so, I was, I was angry and pissed off that they would do that to Ray Charles. Then we got up and played in the same stage with the same sound system. <laughs> And we did Gypsy Man. Well, people were crazy. And way in the distance, people are going crazy. Yeah. And I, I, and this, and we played, like, we literally played maybe one or two tunes. Like, we go in some other stores like that. And then, I mean, we, we stretched tunes. So, like, on Gypsy Man, long and solo and playing, and I couldn't hear myself frustrated. And then I got, when we finished, the people were going crazy, way in the distance. Then we go towards the dockout, and, and I was mad. Normally in the past, I would do, like, Somebody says that was great. And I say, oh, it's not. It sucked, you know. <laughs> you know. So that was my first moment, and I realized uh, you don't let the, your fans down. <laughs> so by the time they could see my face and leave, that was great, right, like that. I, I, I said, oh, thank you. And I walked in, and there was Steve Gold, Jerry Goldstein, with with John, uh, with uh, George, uh, um, uh, Wayne, uh, um, George Wayne, George Wayne, George Wayne, uh, yeah, the uh, Wayne, George Wayne, the promoter, so the promoter for a uh, jazz festival, yeah, George Wayne, George, he doesn't sound like is it George Wayne, yeah, yeah. and um, and Ray Charles and his camp, and everybody's talking at George Wayne about stuff, you know. And I walked in and I walked through them all, and I walked out, were you George Wayne? He says, Yeah, your, your, sound, your sound system sucks. And everybody thought I was going to mess up the deals, and, and he, George Green said, "You know, the kid is right." Uh, let, me you, uh, let me tell you this: and this, this is showing. This, this, these words came to me, and I'll never forget the words from from BB King. And we were playing a show with BB King in Colorado Springs, and BB King was opening up for War. And here I said, "How could that oh, be?" Yeah. I said, "That could never be." I said, "BB King opened up for War." 
I was embarrassed. Yeah, same thing. So I went up to BB King and said, I said, I said, BB, I said, listen, I said, I'm sorry. I said, I said, you should be opening up. We, we should be opening up for you. We learned by it. So, so, so he said, young man, he said, it's your time. Bam, just like that. I said, oops, I'll wow. shed my ass up right there because BB King says, young man, it's your time. Humbly said, take it, take it where you're supposed to be. Now, he, Isaac Hayes, oh, well, when we were with yeah. Isaac Hayes, totally the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> he, when we was on, the, we couldn't even come out of our dressing rooms. No, no, <laughs> we played. We played, he gave us uh, 20 <laughs> minutes. Over oh, yeah, I got less. We couldn't have never six and people minutes. went nuts and they want us to continue more. Yeah, and but he wouldn't let, then the next day he had it cut it down. Because to we like opened 10 up, minutes, right. 15 minutes. The next day it was like 10 minutes. Then he <laughs> told us to get up. Yeah, because we started out, we both opened up our eyes again. Like, hey, we did such a great job. People going nuts. Yeah, what, what about what about what about we fan with with Alton John? Oh, oh, <laughs> we was over in Cairns. And we were with Eric Burton and, and at that Cannes Festival, film festival. No, not film, it was music, the, but it was music, music. Yeah, right there. So the rule was each act was supposed to have one song, it was supposed to be real short. And then, like Howard pointed out, it was Eric Burton and War. So then we got up there, Eric was going. And no, we played. No, it wasn't like that. It was Steve Gold told their management uh -huh. that we, we are much more intense kind of a band. Right. Because it was going to be. You know, so we should we should uh, start we should let him start first. Yeah, this is and then and then Curtis goes. Then we go on. Then it right. takes again. Then he right. goes and they didn't want Elton John to go up uh, to to before, to us. before us. So we had to do the thing. When the curtains closed us, the people booed. They yeah. won more. Yeah, the so they opened up again, and we continue playing. And Elton John, was, he got he start banging like. Like upset, the and, little bat, my dog. Yeah. and then he <laughs> left. He left the venue, and when we were done, we played two shows there because he went us up. They could come on back, come on back. But he got he got the success. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's the time and all the time. And it's still, but it's, it was uh, all fine. What else can we? Who else can we talk about? Oh, Jimmy Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix. Oh, oh that one. He was amazing. Well, I know the night before he made his travel, say die, say transition. Wow. Him and I were in London. We were going down an alley, Soho. It was just us two. And I said, Jimmy, where are you taking me? He says, come on, Brown, we'll show you how to eat. We had chicken tandoori. And then the next day, we went to Ronnie Scott's. And then tell him what happened. Well, I'll tell you, we, 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 first night Jimmy came in, he was a little stoned, and, you know, he couldn't play. But that next night, we were on stage playing, and I saw Jimmy walking through the audience with his strap, and his eyes were crystal clear, white. You know, I said, "This, this guy's coming to business." So I had I took my Gibson guitar and I pulled it out the amplifier. I said, "Jimmy, see, I'm bailing Jack because you know here's <laughs> you know, number one guitar player on the whole planet. I'm not gonna be on the stage with him, period." So he told me, he "says Stay." He said, "Plug right back in." I said, okay. So I plugged back <laughs> in. We start jamming, 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 and then we got to playing this song, Mother Earth. And Jimmy was, he, he laid into that guitar solo. I think that you could just hear the pain of his blues playing when he was doing it. That was his last performance on the stage for anybody to hear was, was when he was with Eric Bird and War at Ronnie Scott's Club in, in, in London. You know, I, I, the, the thing I'll add to it is, I, first of all, the timeline, the day that he played, the last time he played, he was, he was uh, uh, I remember being messed up. Yeah, well, not not the day before, messed up, and and he was leaning against the wall. He wasn't feeling good, but he was playing, and there were people there from Liberty Records, who was who was there because Eric Burden and Eric Burden and Wall was going to be signed, like the Black Man's Burden album was going to be signed to Liberty Records in for Europe, and what I thought was really cold was here's Hendrix, not in the best shape. But we went on with much respect to him. But these people are, are brooding. And Howard played an amazing solo that night. And so they were knocking Jimi Hendrix. That's the part I didn't like. Yeah. They were like knocking Jimi yeah. Hendrix. You know, it's like because he's supposed to be the best. And he wasn't in maybe best shape, but he was amazing. Yeah, Hendrix great. always been amazing. And Howard was top of his game. So they were like, it's like this uh, rivalry thing, like, you know, like. Uh, Condescending to to Jimmy and putting up because 
We have to be in the camp that Liberty Records is, you know, that kind of bullshit. You know, you know I might add to this. You know what I'm saying? It's that competitiveness, yeah. which. I might add to He was standing over my left shoulder, because I'm the drummer. And I remember I'm going, da, 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 da. and he's talking in his left ear, saying to me, yeah, bro, right there, right there, bro. And I can look over to my right and I can see his fingers. You stand right, right here. He was there, yeah. and I was standing here. I remember being there. I remember being right there. Yeah. And I look over and I see his finger. He's talking to that ear. And yeah. Now, let me tell you what, what I remember the most. The, 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 the night that Jimmy passed away, he passed away. And, and I remember that night Terry McVeigh came back to the hotel and he had Jimmy Strat. And for whatever reason, announced me, he took the Strat. And put it in my room on on the Holiday Inn at two beds, and the, 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 I was here, and Jimmy Strat was in the next bed, and I I never even touched it. I mean, it was like too much magic on the guitar. That was Jimmy Strat. I mean, you know, I, I was honestly. That's before you knew he made his transition. Yeah, I knew he was dead, but the, the transition, whatever you want to know. But the, the, his guitar was in my room for two days before they came and took it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I remember when he, when uh, we finished the set, uh, we found out because Terry had left. We found out more details that Monique, uh, the German chick, his girlfriend, called and uh, had found him. And Terry said, "Call an ambulance." And so he Terry left and met. And then Eric, when we finished the set, Eric took off to to where yeah. we were in hospital. And I remember walking around London, man. It was like the weariest yeah. vibe. You know, when I got back to California, went home, I seen our first album we did with Eric and Jimmy Hendrix experience, and it was side by side. <laughs> wow. And then unfortunately, I saw a lot of people who wanted to piggyback on his, his uh, reputation, you know, milking Jimmy Hendrix for whatever, even after he was passed away. Yeah. It just, um, it just saw a lot of stuff. And I, I met Hendrix a year before at Eric's house. And he sounded like he was pretty down and depressed, and he was, he was a very soft, very, um, he wasn't like abrasive, he was a very mild, very, very shy almost of a human being. I mean, um, you know, being noticed that because he was like bigger than life, and, but he never was very aggressive talking. Yeah. But he was always, he felt, Eric and him, from what I saw, had a, had a connection because the same guy who screwed the animals, Screwed it, uh, Jimi Hendrix, Mike Jeffries. Hmm. And, and, and the thing about the music industry, which most bands are all victim of, we come into this industry like with open arms. You know, this we're we're, we're, yeah, true, right. we're, we're true <laughs> to our music, and we want we want to just play music. And you do get paid, but you trust in too many people too much. And what they do is throughout the industry is they just have a formula for taking advantage of bands. And to this day. It still goes on because it's unchallenged. Well, because uh, most of us, we we are naive to how things work, and we didn't take responsibility to uh, to know things. Like so, we have expectations, and other people are short-term greed. They just yeah. look at what they can get now, and instead of saying, "Listen, that kid, uh, don't make this deal with me," so you know what's going on. You know? When you're talking, when you're talking to 17, 18 year old kids. With a fresh out of high school, fresh out of first record deal. You don't even know what a record deal really don't even is. Know. Just so, so I, I remember, I remember when our first contract. I'm not gonna mention the name. They said, "Well, you don't need a lawyer. Use my lawyer." You know. <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Oh, well, we we so good. We'll take your lawyer." Which, yeah. which by the way, lawyer, and then we'll charge you for using our. <laughs> no, no. Which, which by the way, in the legal world is is also illegal, right? Because if you don't have, if you don't have representation yourself, and you'd be smart enough, you can in the legal world you can say, "I was I was told to use that same person." Yeah. That's a conflict of interest. There's a lot of things people but don't see, we didn't we didn't know at the time. Say, well, we're we're friends and everything. Well, you don't need lawyer. Use my lawyer. Yeah. That was the biggest mistake we ever made. We didn't charge you for it. Yeah. <laughs> Three times over. Oh yeah, of course. Oh. And then uh, uh oh, oh why oh, can't we be friends? Why can I remember you when you drink my yeah, so, <laughs> so this record, you guys really bounced back in a big way with this one. With some people it may be their favorite in 1975. Huge seller. We already talked about why we can't be friends. The title track, Low Rider is a standard. Heartbeat is one that I just 
feel people missed a lot. And uh, it's you fun. Know, Al, you're talking about that being from a jam. It's a heck of a jam. I love that. I can never hear enough of heartbeat. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you guys took that time off. It seemed like you got real serious again with this one. So how did this well, one I come about? We stopped being complacent because that drop, I always say to myself, everybody, when you're at the top of the hill, I don't judge people by when they're at the top of the hill. It's when you have to make that journey down the hill and you got to go across that desert and then work your way back up to the top of the hill. That's when you can judge character. So we had went through, we had those other records, we'd gotten complacent. And at that time, when we came around, we started seeing, we was over taking Japan somewhere, and we started realizing, wow, you know, if something happened, our closest friends, we're friends, we're in a total place, we don't speak the language. We don't, uh, you know, we don't have the same customs and stuff. You're talking about the two like everything? Yeah. Well, actually, the two like we friends came from different things, but when we played, like Howard being the front man, right. and Howard is always trying to to touch buttons and somebody like a, like a comedian trying to get a laugh, <laughs> and nobody's responding. And because the Japanese culture back then, not as, not now, but back then, is is is, is, is was very funny because. It's the only, when you call something a concert, a concert, that means you can't talk. You can right. talk <laughs> like a symphony. So, so even if it's rock and roll or contemporary music, when it, back then it was called a concert. So I noticed that people in, in Japan who have to, who always have to answer to the boss or the wife, either one, and, the they, and they're both. <laughs> no, they're, they're each, each quarterly, every three months, they're supposed to get a raise. Are you a bad boy? You didn't do good in, in your job or the wife. There's a lot of stress. So people are exhausted. And when they come to a concert, even if the boss is next to it, this is the only time it's appropriate where you can be you can you can be allowed to ignore the boss because it's a concert. So you see half the people like exhausted, like they're like like out of it, totally out of it. Like they're not like they're sleeping. They're just they're just so exhausted and taking in the music. And how it is like thinking nobody liked it. And then at the end of the show, people went go crazy, stand up and go nuts. Ran and that, was, and that was that shock you win. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah, yeah, I know. Just when people say, hey, anybody? And maybe one person, yahoo! Somebody, someone went Japanese person. <laughs> one thing about that, why can't we be friends? I don't know if you know this or not, but it was the first song beamed into outer space. Yeah. When the Russians and the Americans made the Soul Use Hook Up. That was a them and Tenny, what's the other country guy? Oh yeah. Conway uh, yeah. Or yeah. But they played Why Can't We Be Friends. Yeah, okay. And I've heard since then that song was even in a capsule, supposedly out there. So if any <laughs> any uh, <laughs> Martians or something find it. You think about the aliens out there. The aliens <laughs> already <laughs> here. <laughs> down there for like so we're in office so, now. So, so <laughs> we have been working for the aliens at the record company. Let me tell you about this other song that was just one of our most signature songs. <laughs> Was, no was a Charles Miller song called Low Rider, which was, which was when we first did it, it wasn't a main sing, uh, string song. It was like a song that was like uh, left on the album, still sort of. But it became one of the biggest songs that Wars ever did. But it didn't Lowrider. start with, uh, it, it, like, uh, for example, when we talk about being a jam band, if you listen to Heartbeat, go back to Heartbeat, right. Hale is jamming and singing and playing at the same yeah. time. He doesn't say bring in Lee on the manga, bring in Charles Miller. You don't hear that because Charles and I was not there at that time. We were all probably drinking tequila, going fishing. Or <laughs> and the next, and the, and the same thing when we went into the studio with Lowrider, there was a day, Harold and BB had laid a track down. Uh -huh. And we had been up all night trying to do a crab fishing because I told him it's nocturnal, we have to do it at night. <laughs> I came like six in the morning to the studio and there was that backtrack and you had played on the back of the like, bah, 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 yeah. bah, bah. And that's when that's when Charles came up with the words low rider. And that's why I remember I took that mind goes da 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 then Charles went ba 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 da so that's how that evolved. Sometimes if we weren't all there at the same time, but it was like, but yeah, it was making this shit up. Yeah, but then lowriders, I'm sorry, but lowriders were the first, because like in Southern California, where we came from, Howard remember this, or, you know, it was not unusual for us. We'd go and take the springs in the back of our 53 Plymouth or whatever, 
And I'd go and take I'd go and take a torch and cut a couple of the rolls off on our back rear springs, and then we hit bumps and go bam like that, or they'd be too low. So we had this culture going on, you know, in in Southern California, Compton, Long Beach, yeah. uh, San Pedro. Yeah. I know well. We had our, our, our cars, and then we were the first recyclers before they started talking about recycling. Because what we were doing, we were going into wrecking yards like over in Wilmington. Or South Law, they would have all these junkyards. And then we'd go and get parts off the other cars and build them. I remember one time I had this forklift, you know, this uh, lift on the back of a truck. And if you didn't watch out, it got to a point, you'd be in your house somewhere at night, somebody come and steal your, you know, your jet, your, your uh, pumps off of it so they could raise the cars up and down. So it was a culture. Charles was one of those lowrider guys because he's in Long Beach, he'd have an old car. And we just found it was one of those things to take it and tweak it out. The, the, what Charles Miller left us with was Low Rider. He left us with one of the biggest selling war songs ever. And, and out of our whole category, it's Low Rider. And Charles Miller, uh, uh, the grace of God, left us with that song. That's left the world with Low Rider song. Not just us. And if you look at our video, we got a video on YouTube, Low Rider. That was the actual our very first attempt at making video and film. film so, yeah, yeah. well, film, man. Yeah. Because when I started going into Hollywood and we wanted to make an experiment with videos and stuff, a, or a film or you know, for television, that's when they were just starting to come with the concept of making videos to promote or film to promote music. So we actually went in and we kind of put it together ourselves, our A and B roll with titles. I remember us taking cameras and stuff, going into East LA, hanging over the side of them, hanging over the side of the freeway there. And the, Long Beach or whatever freeway with a rope and we're shooting the police cars going by. And that was a, a whole turn, I think, right at that moment when we did Lowrider, that's when the music industry, the way they started promoting the music, the way they started thinking. Well, they made, yeah, they made multimedia. Made, yeah. But the thing about Lowrider is because it was, we were like really embraced by, by Chicanos and the whole Lowrider yeah. and all that. Um, I mean, Sometimes I thought we were like treated like the Beatles, like this whole thing. <laughs> Even though we we were like a, a world band, or, or, you know, world um, music. Yeah. So we would be honored a lot of times to be part of those cultures. And I remember one time we went we went this place where they had the lowrider cars, like about two hundred of these most beautiful machines cars. And we had we were asked to be ju the judges and pick the oh, yeah, five yeah. winners. <laughs> Boy, we knew better. We, as soon as we got off stage, we like got into the limousine, <laughs> took off. There's no way in the world we're going to pick five. I mean, everybody should have won, you know. <laughs> it was like, yeah, because you know, the people that uh, came with the Lowrider magazine. It's still yeah. being published. Yeah, Lowrider magazine. Yeah, Rudy, at man. 74, 17 Sunset, before it even started, they would come to our office. Yeah. We had a little trailer. They'd, they'd come back there and sit in the back and talk to us about this magazine. So it's the thing that's going. Matter of fact, there's a couple of uh, tribute bands that are out there right now. One is called the Cisco Kid Band. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're a tribute band and they're actually giving us the acknowledgement of you know being the that you know part of that culture. You actually have the gold record award right behind your head there, right there on the wall. Which one? Friends? Well, I can't oh, yeah. friends. Yeah. well we I got everyone. I just have some in different rooms. I have in the music room a bunch. This is a Friends, a Galaxy, World of the Ghetto, <coughs> uh, Slipping in Darkness, mm -hmm. and uh, Spill of Wine. Spill, Spill of Wine was our first gold record. And then is, uh, what do we got here? Platinum Hits. Oh, great, great. Yeah, yeah, I don't have most, I've given most of my way, but here's a, when I remember when we got our first gold record, Spill the Wine, I threw mine on the ground and stomped on it. Not me. Because I didn't want it to go to my head. <laughs> it, went to, it, went to, it went to his feet. So that's, that's what happens when you make too much money. <laughs> and he didn't want to go because, and then thank God we have many more. For me, I've given most of mine. Well, the, the truth, the, the real truth is, we used to, these things you could buy years ago as trophies, you know? And everybody was excited, it was a gold album on the wall. But, but give me the this money. Is, this is what's valuable the RIAA. It's when they're certified, that's the real deal. Yeah. And sometimes you would do something like you need a prop when you photograph, like with the mayor or something when we're doing your thing in the, in the city. 
So we so before we got the actually gold album to give to the person, we would just have a gold album. We got a trophy <laughs> up there, and then after we give it back to me. Now I get you the real one later. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't too long ago. Great painting records. <laughs> wasn't too long ago. One of our uh, people, well, I should call him adversary stuff, but a producer, a producer. About I don't know six, seven years ago or something. We're talking on the phone, and he says, uh, "Harold." I get you guys a gold star on Sunset Boulevard, you know, on the Hollywood Boulevard, you know, on them gold stars. Yeah. He didn't know how to research. It. 30000 Yeah. You, the more money you spend, the closer you get to go out of the time. So he told me, we'll get you a, how would you guys like to have a gold star? I said, nah, give us the money. We can't eat the star. <laughs> the moral to the story is, no, we, you know, a lot of that stuff is great to have, but you know, you got to put it in, you know, in its perspective, in its place. When the plumbers used to come to my house, the first thing I did when I was living in LA, <laughs> I would sing all the gold albums <laughs> because I didn't want somebody to rob me later to be so, like, lose their mind. Like, like you know, people get so mesmerized with this sensationalism, uh, you know. They want to overcharge I, I, I would rather, <laughs> no, I mean, no, I would overcharge anything. I'm just saying the music industry is, there's so much of the sensationalism. Right. I wish it would be more in the music. Right. Well, I, I always did whenever I went to go buy a new car or something like that. Yeah. I dressed up real ragged. <laughs> <laughs> if I was going to go buy something, I didn't want to look like the Chinese have a saying, good merchant does not reveal wares. So if I go in there looking like I'm all rich and stuff, hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, I think I'm going to just tack an extra few grand on there. Nope. <laughs>